So far, we understand X509 PKIs as authorities that issue X509 certificates to end entities with which the authorities assign cryptographic public keys to end entities that can then be used for various cryptographic purposes. To describe the workings a bit more precise now, what happens on a conceptual level in an X509 PKI is the following. The end entities in an X509 PKI, which we consider to, for example, being Alice and Bob, in a first step request each an X509 certificate from the PKI to obtain a certification for a cryptographic public key. The PKI, upon receiving this request for a certificate, validates and confirms the identity of the requesting end entity. And if the identity is successfully confirmed, the PKI creates the X509 certificate and makes the X509 certificate publicly available by, for example, publishing the certificate into a public repository of certificates. The certificate can, of course, also just be sent back to the requesting end entity, but in order for this certificate to be useful, it needs to be made available to other peers as well in order for them to get access to the public key. Given that all the information contained in a certificate is information that ought to be public information, it's absolutely fine to just assume that the PKI, upon creating a certificate, pushes this into a public repository of certificates, such that the certificate is accessible to anyone that in the end will really need it. Once the certificate is in this public repository, this certificate can then be fetched by the end entities, depending on the actual use case. If, for example, Alice wants to encrypt data such that only Bob can access the data, then Alice would have to fetch the certificate of Bob. And if Bob, for example, wanted to verify a digital signature created by Alice, then Bob would need to fetch the corresponding certificate of Alice. Once the proper certificates are fetched from the repository, the end entities then can finally retrieve the public keys from these certificates and make use of them in order to secure the data exchange between them. The previous slide explained the conceptual idea of PKIs, and it's time to now have a look at the actual components making up such a PKI. The end entities we got to know as, for example, natural persons like Alice and Bob, but end entities can also be legal persons like a company such as IBM or Google, and end entities can also be machines, applications, and services such as, for example, IoT devices or web servers. The requests sent by the end entities asking for the X509 certificate is then actually sent to registration authorities, which are systems delegated to perform the identification of the end entities applying for the certificates. Very often, these registration authorities come along as user-friendly GUIs or APIs, and once the registration authority confirmed the identity of the requesting end entity, the request for the issuance of a certificate is then forwarded to a certificate authority, CA, with these CAs then really just being collections of hardware, software, operating personnel and procedures delegated to create, issue and revoke X509 certificates. Once the CA created the certificate, the CA stores them into a public repository, which are systems to store X509 certificates together with certificate revocation lists, CRLs, with the repository having to provide means for accessing and distributing the stored certificates and CRLs, where we will get to know the real purpose of CRLs once we talk about the validations of certificates in a later session. Presented here so far is just a very first set of actual components making up X509 PKIs, 
but this is not yet the full picture and we will have to make one more refinement at a later stage to have the full set of components presented as specified by RFC 5280 that defines these X509 public key infrastructures.